Hi, Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another new Savvy Sightseer video vacation. Today we are off to Amsterdam. When you start talking about Amsterdam, generally the first question is, what is Amsterdam? Is it the name of a country? Or is the country named the Dutch land? Or the Netherlands? Or Holland? Let's resolve that confusion right away. The name of the country is the Netherlands, which is a word that translates to the lowlands. That's because the country is somewhat altitude challenged. More than a quarter of it is below sea level. There are 12 provinces that comprise the country. Two of the most important were North and South Holland. They were the economic, political, and power bases of the country. Over time, they became collectively known as Holland, and so did the overall region, and then all the Netherlands became synonymous as Holland. Amsterdam is a city in North Holland. It is also the province's capital city and ultimately became the capital of the Netherlands. Now that that's all crystal clear, we come to one more term, Dutch. Where did that come from? Well, it's from an archaic Germanic term meaning people. So when you say the Dutch Netherlands, you are saying the people of the lowlands and for short, the Dutch. When I went to Amsterdam, it was my first time picking one city to stay put in and I was independent of organized tours. I wasn't sure how much time to budget for it and settled on about eight days and wondered if that was too much for one place. Not even close. I could have spent more time easily. It is one of my favorite sightseer cities because it is arguably the most pedestrian friendly. It's the only time I didn't use public transit except to go to and from the airport or to head out of town for a day trip. It's flat by design and loaded with all kinds of diverse things to see. So join me now as I take you to the amazing city of Amsterdam. It is a very compact city. The central most touristy part is designated a UNESCO World Heritage Cultural Site and is only about five square miles and everything is easily accessible by walking. The red dot is where you find Dam Square, the heartbeat of central Amsterdam. Everything radiates from here. Originally, the city was a fishing village then in 1260, the fishermen dammed up the Amstel River to make a safe harbor for their boats, hence the name Amstel Dam. This safe harbor led to great prosperity as traders opted more and more to pull up here. With affluence, though, came threats. City leaders decided a defense moat was needed and the Singal Canal was dug surrounding the port area. This 17th century map shows the clear delineation between old Amsterdam, surrounded by the Sengal def defense moat, and beyond it you see was mostly marshland. The best first stop to get your bearings before exploring Amsterdam is the Museum of the Amsterdam Canals, where the city's development and history is played out through 3D and multimedia presentations. This giant digital diorama displays the parade of growth that led to an overpopulation of the city from the 13th to the 17th centuries when trade really exploded and Amsterdam was in its golden age. This is one of my favorite areas of the museum, the planning room, where you can be the proverbial fly on the wall and listen in to city planners arguing options for expanding and designing the city. Maps on the table and around the walls present those options from each of the major stakeholders the military, political, social, and financial sectors as they embarked in the early 1600s on an ambitious expansion project, one that would take almost 50 years to complete. Canals were dug, land reclaimed, and houses built, at first managing the growing population, but ultimately leading to even more expansion as the city grew four times its size. Amsterdam became one of the largest cities in the world at the uh, during the 17th century and one of the most important ports in the world. It quickly became the center of world economy and the Dutch East India Company established the world's first stock exchange. The expansion included digging three main canals. 30-foot wood pilings were pounded through mud to stable sand to build structures. Today's concrete pilings do the job. Some of them up to 120 feet long are used and there are about 11 million poles in total throughout the city. Amsterdam's canal layout is considered the most intricate and efficient system of navigable waterways in the world. From the original defense moat 
Sengal, the three con- there are three concentric canals that emanate from the city center. The innermost is the Herringrat, or the Gentleman's Canal. This became home to the wealthiest merchants, and it is still a prestigious address. The mayor lives here. The next canal out is Kaisergrat, or the Emperor's, and is the widest at 100 feet across. The farthest out is the Prisengrat, or the Prince's Canal. I found the trick for navigating the city is to rely on the canals, not street names, which could be hard for non-natives to read, or sometimes even to find. Some streets are easy to bypass altogether because to us, they're little more than the width of a small path. The museum is housed in the stately home built between 1663 and 1665 on the Herringrat for Carol Gerards, a rich merchant. Over the years, it was owned by several noted Dutch merchants, including Jan Vilnik, who helped finance both the development of New York and the American government during the War of Independence. This is another fascinatingly designed room. Ringing the walls is the city skyline, dotted with peepholes. Looking through these, you can glimpse a view of the city during a particular era to see how the streets and houses looked. A dollhouse-style replica gives a unique glimpse of upper-class families at home over the course of 400 years. Typically, this type of display would have fixed figures, but here you get live action. It is peopled by 3D holograms in period dress. Look through the windows to watch as they carry on the daily activities of their era, from the Victorian times and up to more modern times. The city planners were not only smart but well ahead of the times. Garden sections at the back of houses were integral in protecting the inner city against over-industrialization. Residents were not permitted to build on the plots of land between the houses, and it was also decreed that a large proportion of these plots had to be devoted to garden space. This clever planning saved Amsterdam from becoming a concrete jungle. As a former high school English teacher, I taught the diary of Anne Frank, and so there was no way I'd go to Amsterdam and not experience the actual setting of her world-known diary, detailing life in hiding during World War II. The Jewish Frank family had moved to Holland from Germany after Hitler became chancellor to escape his deadly regime there. They'd started a spice and pectin business with a partner in this warehouse with an unassuming exterior facing the prison grot canal. In June 1942, Anne, the Frank's youngest of two daughters, turned 13. She had dreamt of being a writer, and for her birthday, her father gave her a diary. She wrote in it religiously. Just a month later, when the Nazis issued a notice for her oldest sister, Margot, to report to a work camp, the family decided it was futile to try to run again and chose instead to take refuge in a little-known set of rooms at the top back end of the warehouse to avoid being shipped off to camps. Anne's little book was to become essential reading for the world. Because her diary survived and she published and it was published, we have her first hand account of what life in hiding from the Nazis was like. Every aspect of the Anne Frank Museum is powerful and very moving. It's compelling to read excerpts of her diary and remember she was just a young teenager sharing her thoughts. While our shelter-in-place restrictions don't begin to compare to the Frank experience, perhaps her simple reflections are more impactful for people who for probably the first time recently had their movements limited. By the way, even in good times, tickets for the museum are hard to come by, and a particular time and day slot must be booked well in advance to visit it. Stepping behind the movable bookcase that had hidden the entrance to the Frank family's living quarters evokes an immediate respect for what the inhabitants endured as they hoped for a quick end of Nazi terrorism in Amsterdam. As a teacher, we staged the Anne Frank play and watched movies, but one of the driving forces for me wanting to see the actual place was to see what the real conditions were and just how much space these people lived in. It was fascinating to see evidence of how they had tried for normalcy in a very abnormal situation. You can see pencil marks etched on the wall that mark the changing heights of Anne and Margot during hiding. The entire annex is barely 800 square feet in area, and ultimately it served as home to two families, 
the Franks and the Van Pels, who were the former co-owners of the warehouse's spice and pectin business. There was also a friend, Fritz Pfeffer. Their names were slightly changed for the diary's publication. How cramped and spartan the conditions are is immediately driven home when walking from one tiny room to an even tinier room. This was Anne and Fritz's room, just under 17 feet by seven feet. Notice the blackout curtains and the pictures on the wall. Anne dotted the room with images of glamorous people clipped from magazines as she imagined living a very different life beyond the small annex. That eight people could live in virtual silence here for more than two years while beyond the bookcase a business bustled with potential whistleblowers is very difficult to comprehend. Fearing someone would come through the bookcase and up the stairs to find them must have been unbearable. Sadly, it did happen in August 1944. It's humbling to step into Anne's world and consider her unending belief. Despite everything she wrote, I believe people really are good at heart. And it is emotional to stand in that small annex, listening to the chimes of a nearby church's clock tower, the same ones Anne wrote about, saying that they soothed her. They ring out from just a few steps away from the warehouse at the 17th century Westerkirk, the largest Protestant church at the time in the Netherlands. Since first opening to parishioners in 1631, the Westerkirk has been the venue of countless historic moments over the centuries, including some royal weddings. Dutch art great Rembrandt was buried in a, as a pauper in an unmarked grave at the church in 1669. A spire added in 1638 brought the Westerkirk to 279 feet tall, Amsterdam's highest church tower. Amsterdam lays claim to having the only floating flower market in the world. It's a string of 15 canal boats seen here on the right side of your screen that's been operating since 1862. Opposite them are chocolate and cheese shops with lots of free samples, the perfect stop for hungry tourists. The market is teeming with Dutch tulips, Known the world over, they come in every conceivable color. Something to consider, though, before stocking up. How is it possible to bring plant bulbs on a plane, given agricultural restrictions? Most of the tulip bulbs are not allowed to be brought home with you. A sign high on the wall alerts prospective buyers that the bulbs could be shipped. But given how many tourists I saw scooping them up, this was not noticed and they likely were in for a shock at the airport. And you're also not getting on a plane to New York with that cannabis starter kit. Some teens I saw should have saved their six euro. Something to know about the Dutch culture. Soft drugs like pot are allowed by a sort of gray area in their law if it's for personal use in much the same way cigarettes and booze are here. To purchase some pot, the place to go is a coffee house for coffee, you go to a cafe. Cheese is certainly a part of the culture here and has been made in Amsterdam since as far back as 200 BC. In the shops across from the flower market, you can sample all kinds of Gouda, or Houda as they say it, an edam made from various uh, milk of cows, goats, or sheep, and mixed with a variety of herbs. Amsterdam has been called the Venice of the North. There are over 60 miles of canals throughout the city. Venice has fewer canals though, only about 150 to Amsterdam's 165. So maybe it should be called the Amsterdam of the South. There once were even more in Amsterdam, but they were filled in to create roads. Cruising the canals gives a very different view of the city and a boat trip is an absolute must. You'll sail by this beautiful tower built in 1512 as a piece of the city's original protective wall. It housed Amsterdam's military guards stationed there in order to watch for any approaching armies trying to invade the city. The decorative spire and clock were added in 1606, but these led to the nickname Silly Jack because the clock's bells were somewhat unreliable and rang at odd times of the day or not at all. The tower became slightly tilted at one point, giving it another moniker, the Leaning Tower of Amsterdam. It may look familiar to art lovers. Rembrandt often sketched it, but without the 157-foot spire, 
preferring the sparse look of the medieval 16th century brickwork. You can come across any number of interesting things on the water, like a pam the family having a picnic afloat. And if bridges are your thing, you'll find them everywhere. More than 1,200 cross the city's 165 canals. At one spot from a bridge on the Herringrat, you can see 14 other bridges. When small cargo boats became obsolete as modern cargo ships were built, the smaller ones were repurposed as houseboats. There are about 2,500 of them lining the canals, some as old as 100 years. If you are buying one of these houseboats, you're really buying a location. These are strictly regulated and there are really no new spots available. Even on houseboats, they love their flowers. Some are very elegant and dressy, others not so much. Evidently, this homeowner was making some kind of a statement. The sign translates to tunnel vision. Homeowners on the canals are taxed by their amount of street footage, so the houses are typically narrow and very tall. This led to a unique architectural touch, distinctive gables at the top. These are just facades to hide the ugliness of the steeply pitched roofs. Notice they seem to be leaning forward somewhat. Although being built on pilings in mud does lead to some unusual settling patterns, it's not the only reason for the fronts to be leaning forward. The narrowness of the tax evading frontage means very narrow and nearly vertical stairs, impossible for moving furniture. The hook at the top of the gable is used for a rope and pulley system to haul up large items. Because owners didn't want that baby grand piano banging against the house on its way up, they angled the top out a bit from the rest of the house. The upside is the variety of gables that give us a characteristic look to these Dutch houses. On the left, you have what's called a bell gable. On the right is a step one. Here on the left, you have a neck gable, and the other two are forms of bell gables. This is one homeowner who took the frontage tax evasion to an extreme level. It is one of the skinniest houses in Amsterdam, just three feet, three inches wide, but that's just the front. Beyond the entrance, a normal size house opens up much farther back. This canal house may look like many others on the outside, but inside, up in the attic, it hides a secret. Most attics might be filled with junk, but not so here. During the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, Catholicism was driven underground, or in this case, above ground. There you'll find the magnificent three-story Church of Our Lord in the attic. In 1663, a wealthy businessman, Jan Hartmann, merged the attics of three attached homes, converting them into a Catholic church. I absolutely love the rose look of the wood. It exemplifies an ingenious use of limited space. The pillar base opens and swings out for a step-up pulpit from which the priest would preach to the 150 parishioners. Clearly, laws, laws banning the open practice of Catholicism were loosely enforced, because I'm sure someone must have noticed when 150 friends showed up for brunch every Sunday. Despite its age, this church still holds Mass on the first Sunday of every month at 11 a.m. The organ, which was built especially for the church in 1794, is still played on special evenings for wandering concerts, like progressive dinners, this is where guests will roam from one historic venue to another to enjoy period music from these antique pieces. Ironically, this and another nearby church are inside the infamous Red Light District. Amsterdam's legalized prostitution center is a magnet for curious tourists who will find unique and somewhat seedy sex shops in this area of town. One rule strictly enforced in this region is no picture taking of the women in the windows or you could land up in the canal along with your camera. The culture around this center is like that of pot. It's better to legalize it and then be able to tax it than to let it go on illicitly. Here, prostitution is considered a regular job and participants have the same rights, protections, and obligations as any worker in the Netherlands, including paying taxes on their earnings. This iconic district may be in for a change though. According to Forbes, some city planners are looking for ways to redefine parts of Amsterdam following the coronavirus shutdown. Instead of going back to pre-pandemic norms, which included being overrun with tourists, 
They are looking at how to improve the city center areas. One suggestion by the mayor is to not only clean up the red light district, but potentially move it out of the city center to make room for commercial businesses, grocery stores, and housing. The district constitutes a prime site. Damstrat, the street leading from the red di light district, goes right to the Royal Palace doors, just a few blocks away, and to one of the most heavily trafficked spot in town, Dam Square, definitely one of the best people watching places in town. Adjacent to the square stands the Royal Palace, built in 1655 on 13,659 pilings. This splendid building was once the town hall, but when the city was conquered by the French in the early 1800s, Napoleon's brother, Louis, was installed as king and claimed it for his palace. It is an imposing building at 264 feet across and 197 feet deep. Opposite the palace is the National Monument, a 72-foot tall obelisk to honor the World War II dead. Soil from all the provinces and the Dutch West Indies are stored inside. It's embedded with three sculptures, war, the four male figures, peace, a woman and child, and resistance, two men with howling dogs. It is hard to escape reminders of the war years in this town, but one that many tourists do miss is the Dutch Resistance Museum. I found out about it by reading an English language paper I'd picked up at the supermarket. There was a coupon, so I figured I'd give it a look. It appeared a good stop for maybe about an hour. Little did I realize the depth of this museum that took me nearly three hours to absorb. Here, the Dutch people's story is detailed during World War II, from 1940 to 1945. A video introduction discusses the dilemmas facing residents. The Netherlands had been invaded, occupied, and the video questions, what do you do? Do you adapt, collaborate, or resist? Unlike some museums with pictures and placards to passively review, this one is life-size with recreated streets and wall-size photos that evoke the very climate of the war years. One exhibit that has haunted me is this front door that puts you in the footsteps of Jewish families trying to evade a Nazi roundup. With each ring of the door's three bells, you experience the same reception they did from one-time friends and neighbors. When you ring the first one, it, someone whispers, what you're doing is wonderful, and I'd really like to help, but it's dangerous. Another says, I don't think I'll get involved, sorry. And the third, no, we're too scared, we don't dare. I don't know what you should do, but you can't stay here. This museum expertly personalizes the era by focusing on the impact on everyday lives of citizens. Resistance took many forms, like this hidden compartment in a baby buggy for guns and grenades, and printing presses for underground newspapers. There was even a homemade indoor antenna, a kit to create anti-jamming devices so the Dutch could pick up allied broadcasts. Even the leader of the National Organization for Aid to Those in Hiding was eventually on the run. Joe Russell assumed a female persona to escape capture. Imprisoned women took steps to quietly defy their captors and using bits of thread and fabric, they needlepointed pictorial histories of life under Nazi rule. At the end of the occupation, the Dutch worked on a national liberation skirt, one to be made out of patches from the past, sewn together to create a new garment, symbolic of not forgetting the past, rather building on it and carrying it with them into the future. Amsterdam has the highest museum density in the world. There are more than 60 in its small area, but not all are Nazi-related in theme. For art buffs, there's the Rijksmuseum, which covers Dutch art and history. There's the Van Gogh and other museums. And for flower children of the 60s, there's the Hash Marijuana and Hemp Museum. For an entirely different experience, there is the Open Air Museum of Zanseschens, this one is about 12 miles from Amsterdam, and you'll find here a collection of working windmills that are open to the public. For centuries, these statuesque windmills dotted the Netherlands countryside. Some were used to drain and reclaim land, then called polders, 
to be used for farms and communities. Windmills are key in Dutch history. At one time, there were over 10,000 in the country. These mighty structures helped the Dutch to win the battle between land and lake. About 27% of the Netherlands is under sea level, and so they paved the way for Dutch industry to flourish. In the late 18th century, the Netherlands was the first industrialized region in the world with about 600 industries operating on wind power. Some of those industries involved grinding a variety of products for manufacture. One of the mills at the Zanschens is a sawmill, another a paint mill, where raw materials are ground to make paint pigment, and there's an oil mill, where nuts and seeds are ground for and their oil extracted. A spice mill grinds out the key ingredient for Dutch mustard. Some at the park are hundreds of years old and were transplanted there from other regions where progress trumped history. These graceful and majestic structures literally stand with their faces to the wind. An enduring symbol of the Dutch culture is the clog made of wood. These were needed for working in the soggy reclaimed fields because they were better than leather or fabric shoes in protecting farmers from nails and debris, as well as keeping their feet drier in the mud. Wood absorbs perspiration, so they kept the feet cool in summer and warm in winter when they wore thick wool socks. Wooden sho shoes were not solely for human workers. Field horses were also outfitted with clogs for easier walking in the muck and mire. These hand-carved wood pieces also factored into the heritage of Dutch society. Young men would demonstrate their artistry and present a fiancé with a specially carved set. I'm not sure I'd like those hungry beaks pointing at my ankle all day. But I guess she was impressed because a bride wore these ornate versions then down the aisle. Some get a little extreme in their love of clogs, using them for ice and roller skates. And of course, for the baby cows, even if that means mama has to go barefoot. While I didn't see any real baby cows clogged, sad to say I did see many dogs like this little one with her own set of booties. I finally asked about it. Seems the red light district sees its fair share of inebriated visitors who tend to break a few beer bottles on the way. The street sweepers can't get all the little shards, so owners have taken to protecting their pets. Another reason local authorities are considering moving the establishment. Turning wood into shoes is a surprisingly easy feat and takes just a few minutes on a machine similar to a key copier. With a plain chunk of wood mounted next to a guide, a cutting wheel duplicates the cuts of the original shoe, and in moments the general shape of a clog emerges. Finishing is still done by hand, though. Today more sales are made to tourists than to native Dutch, but they are still popular among fishermen and farmers. Since these are made out of a solid piece of wood, you could say the Dutch were at the forefront of the eco-movement. When the shoes wear out, owners recycle them by throwing them in the fire. Amsterdam is the world's most bicycle-friendly city. Just about everyone bikes. It is not unusual to see mothers, grandmothers, business people, police officers, and so on happily biking along. Some people walk their dogs by bike. Others use it to bring home groceries, flowers, or anything else one can think of. I saw one industrious mother manage three children on one two-wheeler. Even more frightening, this child's was the only helmet I saw in town. Amsterdammers on bikes are a marvel. They pack all kinds of things on them. This guy has everything but the kitchen sink. Although it is possible that might be a dishwasher in there. And I do hope he's not texting while biking. While there are about 1.1 million people living in Amsterdam, collectively they own about 847,000 bicycles, about four times the number of cars. They even have bike parking garages. A multi-tiered bike garage adjacent to the main train station has a capacity of 2,500 bikes. That seemed like a lot to me, but it was dwarfed in 2019 when the largest bicycle parking garage in the world with 12,656 parking spaces, was opened in Utrecht, about 30 miles south of Amsterdam. The Dutch have definitely been ahead of current movements here. The push for bikes started back in the 1970s, when they had had too many car versus pedestrian accidents. 
and added to that was the oil crisis, and biking became the primary source of transportation. The other key form of transit in the Netherlands is its highly efficient train system that connects Amsterdam throughout the country and the rest of Europe. The Amsterdam train station is a stunning building, opened to the public in 1889. It was built using 8,067 wooden piles and by forming three artificial small islands on the I Harbor. It's a major public transport transfer spot, serving not only visitors to Amsterdam, but also the city inhabitants. Every day, nearly 200,000 people go through the Amsterdam Central Station. Nearby is a great place to get a bird's eye view of Amsterdam from the public library's seventh floor outdoor terrace. It's always fun to check out libraries in other countries, but seldom do they give you this kind of a bonus. That's the Westerkirk Church towering in the distance. I hope you've enjoyed this visit to Amsterdam. And as you know, I like to close all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate a moment until it becomes a memory. I mean, I like to add to that to say always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. To see more of Amsterdam or any of my European destinations, go to my website. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs in the library, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Take care and enjoy your day.